We bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you for being with us in the previous meetings. As we have our last meeting that deals with the seals and with the trumpets, I pray that you'll give us clear understanding. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, um, the seals portray the destiny of the church. Now, we've already talked about the churches. Now we have seven seals. The seven seals follow the pattern of the seven churches. And that is something we will be uh, seeing here uh, this evening. But we, I'm going to have to pass by, I told you we would have to pass by some, some areas. Um, we come to uh, Revelation 6, 1. It says, when I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. I wish we could talk about the elders and the beasts. We don't have time. We've passed by chapters 4 and 5, which introduce them. But chapters 4 and 5, just to give you a little um, uh, heads up on it, chapters 4 and 5 are a new introduction to Revelation. Chapter 1 is a basic Revelation introduction to the whole book. Chapters 4 and 5 introduce new characters and they will appear all the way through the rest of the, the, rest of the book. Uh, one is called four beasts or actually meaning four creatures, four living creatures. And then the 24 elders. And uh, it is in that context that uh, John... The, the question is asked, who can open the book? And that book is the book of destiny of the church. And no one could open it because no one had the authority to do so. And they looked all over heaven and John was so discouraged he began to cry. The destiny of the church was so important to him. And as he was weeping, one of the elders told him, don't cry. Don't cry. We found, we found the answer. The lion of the tribe of Judah can open it. Now, lion, tribe of Judah, why, well, that, that's a symbol of power, isn't it? The lion is the king of beasts. Judah was the king uh, tribe, kingly tribe. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. And he looked to see who is this triumph. And uh, by the way, I, yes, okay, I almost forgot. We, we, we're talking about the fifth chapter. Uh, <clears throat> he looked to see the lion and he saw a lamb bleeding. It was the lamb that had power. The lion turned out to be a lamb. Remember what I talked to you about, sim about uh, analogies? Well, God can use as many analogies as he wants, and each one has a specific purpose. But Christ is neither a lion nor a lamb. But both are important symbols of him. But to understand his power, we must see his sacrifice. His, the power of the lion, the power of King David, the, the, you know, the king uh, of Judah rests in the sacrifice of Christ as a lamb. And so he saw him as a lamb. And it's in this context that he begins to open these seals, and the seals show the destiny of the church. And so we'll take them one at a time. It says, one of the beasts said, come and see. Now, we spoke of one of the elders. Here's one of the beasts. And these are going to be with us having a part from time to time uh, through the, uh, well, nearly all the way through the book, at least the last couple of chapters. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. What does this picture give to you? Without having studied it a great deal, what, what, uh, what does it seem to indicate? Anyone? Victory. Power. Victory, what else? Power. Power, all right, what else? Purity. Purity. 
How did the church begin? Pure. At Pentecost. Pure. Pure. Was there victory? Well, it wasn't very long. The gospel went clear around the world. But as it was going around the world, it began to change in color. Let's take a look. And when it opened the second book, uh, book uh, seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat upon the uh, upon, uh, sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And uh, there was given unto him a great sword. Now it doesn't look like things are going up, does it? What we find in the churches, we had a gradual downward slide. Now the seals portray the churches in a different light, but they cover the churches again. And we find that there is a gradual change downward. Let's take the next verse. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. Beasts is not a very good translation. Four living creatures say a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. I will not have time to actually discuss these except this is description of famine conditions. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come and see. Now, all four of these living creatures have had a, a voice, one after the other. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And actually, the uh, Greek has to do with a, uh, a, a pale green horse, the, actually the color of death. And the name that sat on, and, and, the, and his name that sat on them was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Can you see the parallel between this and uh, the uh, churches? The churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. The uh, pure church, the loss of first love, where the synagogue of Satan developed in Smyrna, where the Satan's seat is in Pergamos, and the Thyatira, where the church leadership was killing those who refused the apostasy. Now we have white, um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't know that I had just the seal one, two. That should have been white, red, black, and pale green. Those are the seals. Do you see they follow the same pattern? Now, it's extremely important. I won't have much time to spend on pattern because, um, uh, well, we, because we've used our time pretty, pretty much. <laughs> But it's extremely important that we understand the pattern of a revelation just as we understand the patterns of Daniel. It's in, the, in Daniel, it's the patterns that determine the ability to, to determine whether people are teaching truth or error, or whether the idea is within the realm of truth at least, or whether it's off. Because the pattern set in Daniel 2 followed again in Daniel 7 with extension, must be honored the rest of the book. Right? That's right. When it comes to the next one, we have something quite different, and yet it's the same. It doesn't start the same place, and it does not say anything about Rome itself. It does name Medo-Persia by name and Greece by name. So it does something that the others don't do. The others only start with Nebuchadnezzar and say, you are the head of gold. And since he was the king of Babylon, that would represent Babylon as the, as the head of gold. 
But when we come to the third vision, it's somewhat different, but confirms. And we must understand that these are intended to interpret each other. So, Medo-Persia, Greece, both the ram with the two horns and the he-goat with his prominent horn, those two now look backward to the chapter 7 and assure that we are talking about Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Now, this one doesn't say anything about Rome, it just says Medo-Persia. Now it has a great horn. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This one has, yeah, yes, yeah, this one has the great horn. In chapter 7, you have ten horns, and then a horn that uproots three. In this one, it's different in that it doesn't show the extra power or the division of ten. But it shows a horn that is first paganism and then papacy, because the papacy is Rome. And, and, and historians recognize that Rome is an extension of the old pagan empire, which is now married to the Christian church and continues as papal Rome. Well, what I'm saying to you is Daniel has a set pattern, so does Revelation. And we must honor that if we're going to understand now, here we have four different ch churches and four seals, and they follow the same route. For, for, for Ephesus, we have a white horse. For Smyrna, we have a red horse of persecution, red, you know, the blood, and, 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 and also the falling away, too. And then we have the black horse, and then the pale green horse, which is a symbol, it says, of death and hell. Now, what about the fifth one? What are we going to find with the fifth one? Let's take a look. What will you tell me? You can tell me. What are we going to find? Is it going to be another horse? No. Why not? Not likely because it will break the pattern. You see, in the churches, you have four different churches that follow the same pattern. Now the seals follow the same pattern. When you go back to the churches, what happens to the fifth one? It's a Reformation period. Now it's true that the focus is not on the reforming, but of the death of uh, the, the failure to continue reforming. Nevertheless, it's a major change. Let's take a look at the fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they must rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they should be fulfilled. Now we have a totally different situation. No longer do we have this declining thing, but now we have the voice that comes through the Reformation, period. The time for the judgment has not yet come, and Martin Luther recognized that. But it was time for new robes to be given to them, though they were not to be resurrected. They were to remain asleep. What would it mean to have new robes put on when they're dead? Well, when they were killed, what were they killed as? Those who killed them, what did they charge them with? Heresy. They charged them with all kinds of evil. Heresy and, and, and much worse. They were killed falsely during the Reformation period when the Bible was again the, sub, uh, the sola scriptura when they studied the scriptures when they restudied history what did they discover? That these people that were martyred were people who were faithful to God and the robes represent the fact that 
they were acknowledged to be true Christians and not false. But they must remain in the graves. And the judgment is not quite yet. But what does that suggest for the next one? suggests the possibility that it is going to be dealing with the judgment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look and see what, what we find. And even as I go through this, you understand, I, I'm not always sure what's coming up with the next slide, but I do know the patterns. <laughs> well, here it is, here it is. The churches and the seals. I don't think I can read this uh, because of too small and can't read the, the writing as it is not. So I'll look up here with you. All right, Ephesus and the first seal. Smyrna, the second seal. Do you see that downward to, to, to the fourth? Then we have Sardis, the church Sardis, and the fifth seal asking how long? And what do we have? Well, for Philadelphia, we have a sixth seal that introduces judgment. So we're right. If we guess that way, do you see how God develops, through the prophets, develops his message in such a way that we can actually anticipate the next step if we, if we watch carefully? We can, we can actually look into it and say, well, this pattern suggests such and such. Patterns are important. Don't ever forget it. Satan has his own counterfeit interpretations and he has placed some of them in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We need to understand patterns in order to know how to deal with the various groups who come to us or individuals who come to us and say, well, I think we do like this, this, or this, whatever it is. Brothers and sisters, if it doesn't follow the pattern of prophecy, it is not true. Because prophecy is consistent within itself. Chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs, when the shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and the free men uh, and bondmen uh, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of what? Him that sits on the throne who is described by the way in chapter 4. That whole chapter is about the Father sitting up on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, the chapter 5, I just kind of reviewed it a little bit. The Lamb, the wrath of the Lamb. Do you realize that the wrath of the Lamb is more to be feared than anything in all the universe? Why? Because the Lamb offers salvation to everyone. But no one can be saved who does not respond to the Lamb. And the wrath of the Lamb is the wrath against the rejection of truth. The wrath of the Lamb is the wrath of the one who died for everyone. And who is greatly disappointed for anyone to be lost but who cannot do a thing about it because we each make our own choices. Are we true to life or we choose death? And that was the message of the Old Testament. It is the message of the New Testament. Now, going back here again, the question is, oh, I guess we left that verse out, right? All right, the next verse in your Bible. <laughs> the question is, who will be able to stand? And that somehow that's not in there. Is it? it? It's on the very bottom. 
Oh, oh yeah, there it is. It's not here. It, it's a little frame here. You didn't see it. Ah, yeah. Who shall be able to stand? Now that question is an important question. It's one we need to be asking. And it's one that's given a good answer and it immediately is given the answer. And so we'll take chapter 7. And I want you to notice that chapter 7 is a, an insertion between the 6th and 7th seals. Let's take a look at it. And I... And after these things I saw four angels stand on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. Who do you suppose that would be? Christ. Well, before we, we haven't finished reading it yet, but the ascension from the east is in itself a signal. Christ is known as being the king of the north and also of the east. He comes from the east. I wish I had time to go to Isaiah with you and discuss it from there, but we don't have time. Now, uh, ascending from the east, having the seal of what? Of the living God. Now, this is the seal that is announced in the church of Philadelphia, number six. And what seal are we in? Number six, because this insertion goes back and covers the six seal time. But it answers the question raised when Christ comes, but it goes back before his coming. How are we going to be ready? That, you see, it has to go back before. Because the question is, how, who will be able to stand? How? Okay, so uh, it says here uh, that... Uh, and he cried with a loud voice to four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the, the trees, until we have done what? Sealed the servants of God. Where? In their foreheads. Now, if we were able to do the last half of Revelation, we'd find another decree, a death decree, that those uh, must have the seal or mark of the beast in their right hands or in their foreheads. And, you know, Satan doesn't care whether we believe or not, just so we worship him, just so we follow him. But God does care, and that bride must be loyal, and it must be in the mind and in the heart. And unless the sealing takes place there, then it is of no use. Hurt not the earth nor the sea. Now, the very next verses, and I think we will not read all of these because of lack of time. It goes, it says that there are going to be 144,000. Of the tribe of Judah, 140, uh, 12,000. And of the tribe of uh, Reuben, Asher, Naphtali, uh, the Thalem here is Naphtali in the Old Testament, Manasseh, Simeon, Issachar. Le uh, Levi, Issachar, Je Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, so forth. Of each of these tribes, exactly 12,000. What does that suggest? Huh? <clears throat> I hear two or three voices, but no words. <laughs> what does it suggest? Completeness. Completeness, yes, yes. Perfect. What else? Somebody said perfection today? Good, but I want something more. It suggests a symbolic number. For two reasons. And by the way, are only Jews going to be saved? No. Will they be the only ones that don't cry for the rocks and the mountains? No. Uh, do we know where the tribe of Issachar is? <laughs> the tribe of this, the tribe of that? No. We, they're, t they're called the lost tribes of Israel. They were dispersed and they'll never be reformed according to Old Testament scripture never be reformed as a nation. They'll all come together as a unity but only Jacob, Judah is saved. But they all become a part of Judah. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? <clears throat> this has to be a symbolic number. There was a time when I considered it to be a literal number, but so many people are confused. They say, oh, if it's only 144,000 
and there are so many people in the church, and so then what hope is there for me? Don't worry about that. There is every bit of hope. There's not, if, if this is, and by the way, usually, what I've, I've been a little more dogmatic now. I usually say it doesn't matter which it is, literal or symbolic. If it's literal, you'd have just as good a chance. If it's symbolic, you have no better chance. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it's literal or symbolic. Your chance is up to you. You decide. If you make that decision and you live till then, you will be accepted. Christ is not going to cast anyone out. That's right. And it's a question of faith. And these tribes are symbols of different personalities, different experiences. But it shows that people with all kinds of personalities and give different character traits, if they choose to be sealed, they will be sealed by the seal of the living God. And they'll be a part of the 144,000. And the 144,000 is, represents a perfect number. It represents a large number, but it also represents a limited number. It's nothing like universalism here. It is a limited number, but it's a vast number at the same time. We don't need to know how many. But we do need to know what is the quali what are the qualifications. And the single qualification is the seal of God in the forehead. Not in the hand. You can't do it by just keeping Sabbath. You hear what I'm saying? You must love the Sabbath. It, it, it's on the heart and on the mind. Not just in the hand. Well, where are we? Did it change? <clears throat> it's hard for me to read. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Do you notice the refrain? This is in chapter 4 and 5. Chapter 4 is shows the him sits upon the throne, the Father. And start, chapter 5, the Lamb. Christ, who is able to open the seals and who guarantees the salvation of his people. He seals them. And Christ is the one and the only one. And the, all the angels stood around the throne and about the elders and four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped what? God. Now, I wish we had time to run through the whole of chapter, uh, chapter 13. We'll find a decree that everyone worships the beast. Now, that's not one of the four creatures in heaven. It's the beast power on earth, which is the same as Thyatira, which is the papacy. And the two-horned beast, which is the United States, the second half of Revelation 13, will make an image to the beast and force everyone to worship the beast or be killed. So we have a death decree. The death decree that Satan will enforce upon all of God's people. He thinks he's going to wipe out every faithful person of Christ and claim this earth for his own without any interference. Instead, those who refuse to worship the beaster's image will worship the true God. And he will preserve them and save them. And that's what the sealing is all about. They have to be sealed in order to go through that. In order to be faithful during that period of time. And so one of the elders said, answered saying to me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Now that looks forward to chapter 22, 21 and 22 of Revelation. And do you see, it's the 144,000 that other chapters in the last half show will worship Christ in his temple. And they'll be with him continually. Brothers and sisters, God has a tremendous plan to place us on this. You remember, uh, 
he that overcomes, this is Laodicea, time of the judgment. I will grant to you, sit with me on my throne. Even as I have also have come and sit with my Father in his throne. God plans to seat his people who are faithful during the final crisis. Who worship only the God of heaven. And that is our message. Revelation 14, verse 6. Saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Those who go through this judgment crisis will be sealed eternally, and they will also have a seat with Christ on his throne forever as priests and kings traveling through the universe to share the love of Christ, to, to testify to the blood of the Lamb and to the word of testimony. It's a wonderful picture that we have. They are there and serve him in his temple. Where is his temple going to be? On this earth. Now, it says they will serve him day and night in his temple, but I mentioned that they'll be traveling. Does God restrict himself to a certain small office space? No. <laughs> no. We will be permanently located with him and with Christ on his throne. You see, the human race will have been adopted by God as no other race has been because Christ, the new head of this race, has adopted all of us as a part of him. So that now the human race will be connected and linked with God as no other being in the universe. And throughout all time and eternity, we will be the, we will, our praises sounded throughout the universe, the universe will prevent any doubt ever again coming as to the nature of God and his love. And by the way, he alone, we will be sitting on his own, but he alone will be praised. Do you know what? We haven't gotten to the tr trumpets yet. Now what do I have here? The triumph of the Lamb and the union of the bride. So I have to try to remember what this is. Ah, uh, this is still in that same passage. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. See the throne. Where is the throne? On earth. Mm -hmm. And lead them into living waters. And God himself shall wipe away all tears. Well, I can't follow this anymore because uh, at least I need to turn down a few blades. We, we just don't have time to that. Oh, is this the trumpets? All right. Now, who is silence in heaven? This is the last one. This is the seventh seal. And we've already talked about that. Now, here is, a, again, I think that we've seen this one before. The, uh, the Ephesus, the seal, the white horse, the red horse, black horse, pale horse. The question of how long Sardis was the fifth one, uh, Reformation Church, then Philadelphia, the sixth seal, during the judgment time, and then Laodicea with the message of how, and we didn't even take time for that, and we must not, but the threefold medication given to God's people are to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may rich. They say, you think you're rich and increase good. No, no, no. Only his gold will make us rich. And by the way, it's kind of like the United States currency right now. It may be worthless tomorrow. And the people who are selling gold keep advertising this, and they may be right. As a matter of fact, according to the latest news reports, the United States government, the President of the United States has entered into an agreement um, that will devaluate our money immediately. Yeah. I'm not involved in politics, I just read that. But let me tell you something, money will be. <coughs> Will, will have little meaning, and especially for those who are faithful, it will have no meaning because they can't buy or sell. If you can't buy or sell, you have no value at all. But if we have the gold tried in the fire, 
which is, which is faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Then we have something of less. No one can take it from us. And the white raiment, which is the righteousness of Christ, so that we may be clothed. And I'm quoting now more or less from, from, from the Laodicean message. And what else? Ice. Oh, the eyes I have so we can see. You know, God will give us wisdom if we are committed to him. If we claim the goal of the faith that works by love and purifies the soul, claim the garments of Christ's righteousness, the Holy Spirit will give us the wisdom to know between truth and error. We don't have to be afraid, but we do have to be committed. And we have to commit ourselves entirely to him. Now, that is it, and I don't have... What is this coming on? <laughs> Just close that up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to you about the trumpets, and I'm not going to read anything to you until I get to almost to the end, because our time is going. And your seats are getting sore. <laughs> the trumpets. I don't even have the... I've got some patterns for that somewhere. I'm, my thumb drive, but I don't, I'm going to try to get at it now. But you've seen the other and you, you got the idea. The trumpets follow the same pattern, but they are different, just the same as chapter 8 is different than Daniel 2 and 7. You remember that? Same pattern, but not all of it, and some parts different, but absolutely set because the ram is identified specifically as made of Persia. The great goat as Grisha and the great horn as the first king. And we know who the first king was. And that king was known. And you know, I can't even say his name right now. Nebuchadnezzar. No, no, no. Somebody said Alexander. Alexander the Great. <laughs> he marched his army so fast and that goat was seen, his feet hardly touched the ground. Mm -hmm. He marched his army across the middle of Alps, Alps in the middle of the winter, did something that no one ever could have believed possible. And he landed on those troops when they assumed that they have a few months of leisure and, and can rest. And conquered Medo-Persia so quickly and complete compliance with the prophecy. But brothers and sisters, coming down to Revelation, the churches and the seals follow so closely the same pattern. The trumpets are God's judgments upon apostate church. Therefore, they cannot begin when the church is pure. And they don't begin when it's under deep persecution and they don't even begin when Constantine unites the church with the state. But they begin when the leadership of the church begins to martyr those who refuse to accept the apostasy. They begin with the fourth uh, church period, the fourth seal period. Four different groups invading one, two, three, four, all of them coming from the north, they're the tribes, and their first punishment is on the seducer, Rome, who seduced the church. Transformed the church from a Christian church to a pagan church some of whose members continued to follow Christ. But they had to do so at the risk of their lives. And that's when the tribes begin coming down. I won't take time to discuss them, but the four of them. One, two, three, four. So we have the pattern, the four. Just like Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. And then you have the first, second, third, fourth seal, which are white, red, black, and pale green. So you have four different tribes coming down, plundering Rome, destroying Rome.
taken wrong. Then you have a declaration. And I'm doing this quickly because I don't want to get involved in a long period. But you have the declaration. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It says there's an angel that says that. But there are some of our translators who say that really shouldn't be angel. It's eagle. And it doesn't matter to me whether it's an eagle or an angel. But uh, there is a being who shouts, Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I think I did four and I should have done three. It says, that, Woe to those because of the next three that are ready to sound. What are the first two? Well, the first one is the Saracen um, uh, Turks, that, that, uh, uh, Muslims who came down and and uh, who plundered the Christian era, uh, the Christian churches and so forth, and brought God's judgments to the apostate church. The last one is really not discussed. I'm, I'm going to shorten this quickly, but I want to tell you that you need to go home and study Roman, uh, Revelation 10 and 11. And you'll find just as chapter 7 was an insertion into that before the final one, same thing's true here. Only it is an insertion that makes it absolutely certain that the trumpets are not yet in the future. Because in between the sixth and seventh trumpets is the Appearance just the same as Christ appeared in chapter 7 and says, hold on, don't, don't, uh, don't uh, let go the winds until we've sealed the servants of God. Now, in the trumpets between 6 and 7, you have the announcement of the message that seals. And you have Christ himself who appears with a little book in his right hand and he's standing upon the earth and the sea and he swears to him who lives forever and ever that there shall be time no longer. Now that is a complete echo from Daniel 12 where you have the angel swearing by him who lives forever and ever etc., that, that it will be sealed. The sealing has to do with the oath of God. The opening has also. And who is it that opens it? It's Christ himself. And he tells John, he says, take this little book and eat it up. It will be in your belly bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet like honey, delightful. And I took the book, John says, and I ate it, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and my belly had became bitter. And the angel said, you must prophesy again. So it's evident that this is prophecy we're talking about. You must prophesy again. And the angel stood saying, he gave me the, a reed, let's see, the, a reed likened to the rod, saying, rise, measure the temple of God. You see, the great disappointment was the bitterness. And what they had to do immediately after was to study, restudy the temple. A reed, like a rod, measure the temple of God and them that dwell therein. The dwelling, uh, the measurement of the people that dwell therein is a sign of the judgment, because that's when the people that dwell in it are judged. At any rate, that chapter ends with the statement that the temple of God was open in heaven. And I saw the Ark of the Testimony. The testimony is the Ten Commandment Law. The Fourth Commandment is the special command that, that the enemy has chosen to, to destroy and has its own mark of Sunday keeping. I'm running quickly here, but it's in the middle of that chapter that says, when the angel, the seventh angel, shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be what? Finished. Finished. And what is the mystery of God? Christ in you, the hope of 
Paul tells us in Ephesians and Colossians, the mystery of God is Christ in you. It's actually, it, 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 it's the Gentile message, and it says Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is the sealing of the character of God in the hearts and minds of his people. And now it's time for us to close. I have had to run quickly over the last four, but I want you to notice the pattern. The trumpets are historical. That is, they take through the his sweep of history, just the same as the churches and the seals. But notice, every one of them ends us up in the future. In every one of them, the end is still in the future. But, it was in 1844 that that little book was told you where the bitterness took place. And already before that, gave the little book, you must eat it. And then it was in 1844, you have to, you have to prophesy again. This, brothers and sisters, is past, not future. And I want to say as I close that Christ is the sealer. He has already portrayed his plan. He knows how to do it. But there's been resistance on the part of his bride. And part of that resistance has resulted from party warfare of those who are right and those who are wrong. That is, each side thinking they're right and the other is wrong. Now, conservatives are right doctrinally, have been until recently, although many conservatives nowadays are are making some strange changes. But until recently, doc conservatives have held close to the doctrines. But I'm telling you now we have not understood the theology. What is the theology? Theology has to do with understanding of the relationship of doctrines to Christ and to our own experience to salvation. Liberals have tried to help us by Finding some very important things, but in the process of denied basic principles, and therefore, even what they say that is true is no longer true. But neither of us have any basis for pointing a finger at the other. And I say again, let's get out of the party system. Let's just plead with God to help us to be sealed. <coughs> with the seal of the living God. And let us reach out both directions and draw our people in. Many of our liberal brethren are as sincere as any conservative. And many conservatives are wild-eyed fanatics. And I do not mean not to condemn. I speak as a conservative. I do not believe in conservative parties. Or liberal. It's time for us to be of the party of Christ and his righteousness. Amen. Shall we bow? Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. And thank you for loving us because of ourselves and knowing our helplessness and our problems. And thank you for giving us the solution. Forgive us for unwittingly resisting the robe. Teach us how no longer to resist as you seek <coughs> to place it upon us. That which we cannot produce and cannot put on. That you have produced and are eager to put on us. Guide and direct us all in the name of Jesus. Amen.